Then Jesus said to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. Then the manager said to himself, what will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. I have decided to do what, I, what to do so that when I'm dismissed as a manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? He answered, a hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, take your bill, sit down quickly and make it 50. Then he asked another, and how much do you owe? He replied, a hundred containers of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and make it 80. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it is gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much. And whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust to you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, so a very wealthy man has a manager who has been skimming or extorting or otherwise playing fast and loose with that rich man's fortune. We're not told what it is. We're just told that it is. And so he asks him for a final summing up. Okay, what's the bottom line here? Tell me because you're about to be out of here. And the story of the final accounting features the manager's trips to the creditors and having them one by one come to him and his reduction of those bills that the creditors actually owe. And this rascal <laughs> is commended for his prudence. That's actually the word that belongs there, but I think largely because of bankers, uh, we've changed it to something other than prudence, which is, of course, a positive in our society, right? If you're a prudent person. This parable is the absolute poster child for a parable having more than one meaning. I don't know about you, when I grew up, I was taught in Sunday school that a parable was number one, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, or, and, number two, it had one point that Jesus was trying to make. Well, as you can tell from this one, I think there are probably as many points to this as there are people in this sanctuary right now. There's certainly nothing moral, shall we say, about the manager. Bernie Madoff would have been proud to have him on his team. There have been many attempts, which again is pretty typical, to kind of coerce a positive sort of interpretation out of this parable. Some say that that manager was really, in effect, 
reducing the bills by actually removing his large commission from the transaction. Where they get the evidence for that, I don't know. And then there's the other one that, in effect, the rich man was sort of a loan shark, and this manager was trying to cut the exorbitant interest rate in order to leave the principal intact. I don't know where you come up with that one either. Maybe it's sort of like a former member of this congregation and also a former clerk of session used to say, paying jobs make you do strange things. I don't know. I don't really have an interpretation of my own. What I'd like you to listen for, though, is that there are a couple of themes that are pretty important that occur within this parable. The first of those is, there is a proper use for money and possessions. It's very subtle. It gets a little more direct when Jesus starts hammering home after the parable. You may not be aware of this, but, but in all frankness, there are over 2,300 verses in Scripture that deal with possessions, wealth, property, and stewardship. Over 2,300. Half of Jesus' parables deal with, what do you suppose? Possessions, wealth, property, and stewardship. Now, here's this so-called holy book. It's not really a book. It's a holy library of a lot of books. It should be teaching us, so we think, all about God, all about faith, all about being holy. But the Bible spends an inordinate amount of time talking about possessions and money. And why do you suppose that is? Any guesses? Look at the amounts that this manager forgives in the parable. We're used to counting in gallons and in tons and in bushels. And this is just stuff like jugs of olive oil and containers of wheat. And so, you know, once again, we've got a kind of sanitary version of Scripture. His crowds, the people who were listening, the disciples and the Pharisees who were kind of overhearing all of this conversation, would have gasped at the amounts that he was referring to. We would call them something a little different. We would say 900 gallons of olive oil, 1,000 bushels, of wheat. These are not household amounts, people. You know that, right? These are industrial grade, high quality, massive quantity. So the, the portion of the debt that's being forgiven by this unjust manager is far larger than any imaginable debt that anyone would owe. So it's clear there's a proper use for money and possessions. There's a second thing I'll point out, and that it's pretty obvious. This is a family parable, particularly when you pair it with what immediately precedes it. Without looking at the Bible, how many of you know what immediately precedes this parable? Prodigal son. Good, good. The prodigal son comes first, then this one. They're back to back. They're right there. The prodigal son is about a family, right? It's a family operation. This one may not be automatically obvious as a family operation, but it is. Anyone who is a manager of an extremely wealthy person's wherewithal is usually, usually, a slave who has worked his way up to being a free person 
and may well have worked his way up to being an adopted son of that person. Someone with tremendous character and trust. That's who you leave these things with. A family. And it's interesting to me, both the son and the manager are dealing with goods that are not their own. You remember the prodigal son? The prodigal son says to his dad, hey, give me, give me my inheritance now. That's unheard of. Father's still alive. He gives his inheritance away to the son. This guy is playing fast and loose with someone else's money. I know there's a shorthand for that. In a household, that manager is like the son. This is the only place in the New Testament, these two parables, where we find the word squandering in terms of possessions. Only two places. They're right here. They're unique to Luke. You're not going to find them in the other Gospels. They're only here. In each of these parables, there's a turning point. Do you remember the prodigal son? Okay, when he came to himself, he decided he'd arise and go to his father and say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. Right? Turning point. Goes home. Look what happens. This is a turning point as well. I've decided what to do so that when I'm dismissed as manager, people will welcome me into their homes. Turning point. In each of these parables, the father and the rich man do something very unfair and very unusual. The father throws a party for what we would normally think of as the wrong kid. And the rich man commends this manager for his prudence. These people are absolute rogues. They're rascals. They defy convention. They defy honesty. There's nothing particularly admirable about them. Well, let me get to this point. The title for this sermon is drawn by something that two of my children several times over the course of their growing up would ask me, Daddy, tell us a story about when you were bad. That's one of those things you can't really respond to. Because if you do, and there are plenty of stories I have to tell, if you do, you're setting a poor example for your child. And if you don't, all of a sudden they think that ministers can actually walk on water. That that's the way it is, pure and holy. Either way, it's a losing proposition. Tell me a story about when you were bad. I couldn't do it because I can't sanitize my life. But don't you think it's possible that God uses bad people? Don't you think it's possible that it's not just the people who are good all the time? Earlier this month, you may remember that um, Mother Teresa was declared a saint by Pope Francis in one of his canonization masses. She is now considered a saint for the Roman Catholic Church. And I think most of us would concede that she did absolutely wonderful things. But you may also remember that her letters, which she wrote from her inwardness, tell a different story of her experiencing, and I quote, darkness and coldness and emptiness so great that nothing touches my soul. 
okay, now was she a hypocrite for having preached a message of love and having done acts of incredible charity and courage while feeling no presence of God in her heart? To the children of this age, to go back to the parable, the children of this age, this seems like a crafty sort of duplicity to speak one thing and feel another. I'm really amazed that there are as many people at this service as there are. Maybe I shouldn't be. Most of you probably have the game being recorded, right? The football game? No? Yes? Thank you. I knew someone would be honest. Thank you, Paula. We live in a city whose collective attitude can rise and fall with its football team. I don't know why that should be so. Our baseball team's pretty good. People say of Jerry Jones, and I've heard this repeatedly from good friends and also people I don't really know that well, they say, say what you will about Jerry Jones. He may not be a good owner, general manager, but he's just a wonderful businessman. A wonderful businessman, I think Jerry would be at home somewhere in this story. If only in practical terms. Our culture worships winners. And it may be said that we place our trust in a God who values losers, people who've been left behind, the poor, the sick, the wounded, the lost, those whose reputations have been left in tatters. Yet that's exactly what God invites us, I think, to do to place our trust and our love and our hope and our wallets with the one who uses questionable people to reach God's ends. Deuteronomy has, has a wonderful frame um, that it builds in a particular passage. And to paraphrase that frame, I want to just remind you we live in cities we did not build. We drive on roads we did not pave. We live in houses that we did not construct, full of goods that we did not make. Many of us enjoy the fruit of vines we did not plant. And when we have eaten and drunk and become prosperous, do we forget the Lord who enables it all? We, too, are managers of goods that are not our own. We, too, commend the wrong people for their shrewdness, for their prudence, as if the world were our ultimate home. I'll simply say for myself that I am eternally grateful that God is unfair, that I do not get what I really deserve. For it is God who offers what I feel to be an unbelievable, inexpressible grace. The kind of grace of a woman who throws a huge party over a little lost coin. The grace of, of a father who throws a huge party for the wrong son. The grace of a master who unexpectedly commends a manager who has tried to cover his own rear end. Do you need that kind of grace? Do you sense that kind of grace? Because it flows through all of us and through everyone you lay eyes on, not just today, but every day. Amen.